handouts, and I will tell you, I'm confessing to you, for those watching online today, for those sitting here today, there is a bulletin handout, an insert for the sermon. I'm going to decide in 30 seconds whether or not I'm even going to preach on this. I don't know. You, I might take this handout and pitch it, except for the lesson for today. This I do want to read, so bear with me. From the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, on this, the Transfiguration Sunday, the last epiphany before we begin our season of Lent. About eight days after Jesus said this, this I do think I will do. I'm going to stop and comment on a few of these passages as we go. About eight days after Jesus said this, what did Jesus say? Jesus was talking to his disciples and saying that you will need to take up your cross and follow me. Now a cross, a little bit about a cross, we think, oh, I've got to be willing to die for people. That is not what it means to pick up a cross. In fact, there was somebody who helped Jesus pick up a cross, who didn't have to die. Who was his name? Judas. Not Judas. Yeah, I don't remember his name. Simon. Simon of Cyrene, right? Remember, he was asked to pick up Jesus' cross, and I bet you it was a huge relief for Jesus not to have to carry that burden for that period of time. It was a blessing. So that is sometimes what we do for each other. We pick up each other's crosses and help each other. When one person is in desperation and need, we pick it up on their behalf. And then when we are in desperate need, other people are to pick it up on our behalf. Holy communion. We do it together. And so that's what Jesus said eight days prior to this. And then Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him, and they went up into a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of Jesus' face changed. His clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Why? Because who is Jesus after all? This is a revelation, an epiphany of who he ultimately is. This is his true nature. Jesus has been clothed in human form and become like us so he could identify and understand our sufferings and our struggles. But this is his true character. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. Moses and Elijah. Why Moses and Elijah? Because Moses represented the law, Elijah the prophets, and together they represented the entirety of Scripture. So Jesus was surrounded by the witness of everything in God's plan of what was to be. They spoke to Jesus about his departure. Now here's an interesting thing, that word departure actually is translated from the word that we use as the second book of the Bible. What is it? Exodus. exodus. What do we usually think of as the exodus? The Jews leaving Egypt and coming to the promised land. The exodus from Egypt. So Jesus' exodus. They came to talk about Jesus' exodus. From what? From where? Oh, I don't know, from life? Hmm. They came to talk about Jesus' exodus, his departure, which was, he was about to bring fulfillment in Jerusalem. Verse 32, Peter and his companions were very sleepy. Not the first time Peter was very sleepy in Jesus' presence, which is kind of hard to imagine. This tells us more about Jesus' stamina, I think, than it does about Peter. Peter was a very strong man. So it's not like he was a sleepy, dopey guy. But here he is, falling asleep. But when he became fully awake, he saw the glory of the two men standing with him, that with Jesus, and the, men that were, and, the, and the men were leaving Jesus. Peter said, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. How silly is that, huh? Except actually it was an offer of grace and mercy. I think Peter was actually being very faithful here. He understood the significance of the moment, but he wanted to memorialize this forever. But Jesus knew that this wasn't a moment to be memorialized forever. This was something that was temporary. It's here, it's gone. Like many of the events in our lives. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Let's not stop and memorialize it. Let's keep going. You know, let me stop there for a minute. Because in the sermon earlier today, when I was talking with a lot of our older folks in our, our earlier service, one of the things that struck me, our folks in our older service are, are struggling with a great deal of despair. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. 
They are struggling with a great deal of despair in their lives because they are looking around and seeing all the people that have been on their exodus from this life. I have buried 270, I think it is, people in this congregation. Active members in the time that I've been here. Think about that. They were active every Sunday worshipers. And everybody says, what happened to all the people? I buried them all. You can blame me. I might be going to jail here momentarily. <laughs> I, I swear there was nothing nefarious going on. Honest. But it's interesting because those folks in our morning service, the early service, are looking at the past and mourning everything that they've lost. But when you look at this service, and I think sometimes our Tuesday service, the folks are not quite as discouraged here as they are in the early service. We're looking to the future and what's to come still. And so we have folks that are still lost in the past, folks that are looking to the future. Peter wanted to memorialize this event with Jesus by building these booths. He wanted to keep this memorialize this event, memorialize, Jesus is saying, we got to keep going forward. We can't keep looking into the past. We can't memorialize this time, this moment, as great as it may be, because there's something better around the turn. But it's going to cost something. It's going to be cost to it. It's going to cost Jesus' life. Going on, verse 34. While Peter was speaking and stuttering and stumbling along, that's my addition, a cloud appeared and enveloped them. Now, this is very important. Uh, you don't understand this in the translation. This is from the NIV here today. But it enveloped, let me read it the way it should be read, read. While Peter was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And Peter, James, and John were afraid as G Jesus Elisha and Moses entered into the cloud. It's very confusing the way it's said in the NIV, but that's the intention of this. So you can imagine, Peter's all excited, and then all of a sudden it looks like Jesus is gone. They're gone. And so you can imagine how terrified Peter, James, and John were at this point. But a voice came from the cloud in the midst of their great terror and said this, This is my beloved son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And then when the voice had spoken, bam, the cloud disappeared. Jesus was alone with them. And the disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. From what I've done here today, I know, Joanne, I really apologize. You're not filling in anything in that bulletin handout for to you today. You'll have to steal my thing. Because I don't think, I've made my decision, I'm not going to focus on the sermon as written today. For those of you home who have downloaded your handout pages, I need to spend a little bit of time just talking to you today. Directly from my heart about this lesson. There is a reason for this, and I'm going to tell you what changed my trajectory of what I'm preaching today. First of all, we are certainly going to be entering into that 40 days of community, that campaign that is really important for the future of this church, and I believe is going to continue to transform this congregation and direct us in the path that we need to go in. I am hoping that you all participate in that. But there's a second thing that really changed the traje trajectory of this lesson for today in my sermon of <coughs> what I'm going to preach. And that's simply this. When I did the funeral the other day for Don Aiken, a faithful member of this church and a goodly, godly man, I am so grateful I knew him. He was a tough Marine. He was a loving husband and father and a great a, a grandfather and a great great grandfather. He was very generous. He's generous to me personally. I will never tell you what he did for my wife and I because his wife and he made sure that when they gave us things, and they wanted to give us some very, very wonderful gifts, that they said, we don't want anybody else to know about this between us. So I will never tell you what they did, but let me assure you, they were incredibly ridiculous and generous to us. And I'm so grateful for them. And so when I had to do the funeral, I was just, it's, it's heartbreaking, because I've been here for 25 years, I've known these people, I love these people, and it's very hard. If I'd just been a pastor here for five years, it's a funeral, it's sad. These are our family. We love these people. Now imagine for a minute, we have an early service at 9.30, where right now there's maybe 20, 25 people in that service, that's it. 
There are 100 people in that service 15, 10, 15 years ago. There's 20. Five years ago, there were 50. Where did they all go? I buried them all. They're dying. And more and more of them are unable to come to worship. Now, if you are one of those folks that are worshiping in our traditional service early, you're sitting and looking at the church and saying, oh my goodness, we're losing everything. We've lost everybody. And every Sunday, there's one more body that's missing. This week, we are missing Al and Kimiko Beal. Kimiko Beal will never probably come back to worship in this church again. Why? Because she has, now I'm finally permitted to say this, she's known this for a long time, she told me, she swore, she made me swear that I would never tell anybody this, but now I'm okay to say this, she has cancer. She's never coming back to worship here. She is now in hospice care. The last time she worshiped here two weeks ago, that was it. We will never see her in worship again. So you can imagine for these folks in that service, they're becoming increasingly discouraged and frustrated. When I was at the funeral the other day, we had a wonderful woman who was a former member of this church. Her mom and, and aunt were members of this church, but she left this church probably 40 years ago. And she came to the funeral, and she was listening to some of the older people talk, and they talked about how discouraging it is and how there's only maybe 20 people in that early service. And... Um, and, and they're just losing people all the time. And this woman said, then why are you guys still open? Why don't you just close the doors of this church? Why are you here? And she was just adamant about it. Now, I'm running and getting ready for the service, and I would have loved to have just stopped and told her, because there's life here. Okay? Because you don't see everything I see. I'm going to tell you what I saw. Christmas Eve... We had 90-some people in worship. There were a lot of people who normally come to Sunday worship that weren't there, but there were only about 20 people that were kind of guests and visitors. Everybody else that we saw on Christmas Eve, there were probably about 70 there, come at least once a month here. But their work schedules and some other things, because the realities of the day keep them from being here every single Sunday. That's just the reality of today. But if you're one of the seniors and you're looking at things, it's becoming very discouraging and they're lose, losing heart. Now, why do I mention this? Because I don't know where you are at. Maybe you've lost heart. Maybe you're discouraged. I get discouraged sometimes. But I'm going to tell you what happened in our lesson for today. Jesus, and I need you to hear this, was really discouraged. Did you hear me with this? Jesus was really discouraged. Do you want to know why this transfiguration took place? It wasn't for Peter, James, and John. It was for Jesus. Because you see, Jesus, oh, remember I told you, his true form, his true figure, bright and brilliant as lightning. But he has taken on the limitations of humanity. And like a human note is limited, he can too become discouraged. So here's what happened in Jesus' ministry right prior to this. He lost all of his followers except for 12. Thousands of people, the Bible says, Thousands of people were following Jesus. Finally, he offended the last one of them. He got on the last nerve of every single one of them. They all went home, and they all stopped following him except for the 12. Would that be discouraging to you? You turn around, and you have a 1,000 people following you, and next thing you know it, you turn around, all you got are 12, and that's it. But of those 12, one of them is going to deny him. Judas, or betray him, I should say. Peter was going to deny him. He knew this. Of the twelve, only one was going to make it to the cross and be there for him, truly be there for him at his most desperate time of need. And who was that? John. John, right. So you guys know. I've got you, got you thinking. Got your thinking caps on. John, two Johns here today. John was the only one that really was with Jesus at the most desperate time of Jesus' need. Jesus knew that this was going to happen. Jesus knew all that was set out in front of him. Jesus knew that he was about ready to die. He was immensely discouraged. He had literally the weight of the world on his shoulders. You ever felt like this? Have you ever been going 100 miles per hour, everything seems to be going right, and then bam, you slam into a brick wall, and it's like everything comes apart in your life. 
That's what Jesus is going through right now. And so he takes Peter, James, and John to a mountaintop and is there joined by Moses and Elijah. Why? Because Jesus was desperate and needed to be ministered to. <coughs> Notice he didn't go into the mountaintop by himself. He took others with him. This is what I told the folks in our early service today. You are discouraged. You are downcast. You are disheartened. Things seem to be falling apart. Every time you turn around, as you look in the past, you think of everything that we're missing. But I told them two stories, and I'm telling you these stories too. We had one of our children present this morning who comes every single Tuesday night to our Tuesday night kids program. We have nine children in our Tuesday night children's program. They're all boys, by the way. Isn't it a lot of fun? One of those boys was here in church today. I said, what's the church like for you? He said, I love it. Because he gets nine or eight or nine other kids that he loves to play with every single Tuesday night, and he hears about Jesus. This is his church. He's, he's thinking this church is awesome. Let me tell you something else. On Monday night, we had our Young Life group. We had a smaller group on Monday. Maybe, what, uh, of course, maybe nine kids. I don't know how many kids there were. How many kids we have? Uh, or so. One of them, Ben. Ben. Ben is six foot three, six foot four, very lean, tall guy, African American, 17 year old uh, boy, goes to Woodland Hill School District. And, and uh, he's ordering something in line. And we're at Panera Bread and so forth. He's ordering something in line. And the girl ordering said, well, Who are you guys? Where do you guys come from? Ben grabs me by the shoulder, pulls me over to a moment. So I'm kind of like, Huh? He said, This is my pastor. He says, This is my pastor. And this is our church. And we're here to talk about Jesus. This is a 17-year-old boy. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to cry. Because this is what we're here for. This is his church. You don't see him today. But this is his church. And he's being touched by Jesus because of what we do. This is why we're here. People don't always see that. Our seniors don't see this. Our seniors don't see you all. Small group here. But is this a church? Yes. What does the Bible say? How many people does it take to gather together and be two, a church? Two, or, two or, more. or more. But you do have to have two or more because it's not just Jesus and me. It's Jesus and us. us. Oh, now you see where I'm going with this. Because in the next week, we are going to start our Bible studies on 40 days of community. And you need to be encouraged. It's not about Jesus and you. It's about Jesus and us. And Jesus knew this, that even he needed other people. Even God needs other people. That's why we've been created to fellowship with God. Because even God doesn't want to do it alone. God wants us with him. So Jesus, in his desperate time of need, knew exactly what he needed to do. Here's what we do. When we're depressed, when we're sad, we often go into rooms and bawl our eyes out. And that is a wrong thing to do. When we're sad, when we're depressed, guess what we should be doing? We should be going getting Peter and James and John, those people who are closest to us, and say, Hey, will you please come with me and hang with me because I really need you right now. And we need to go and find those people that can surround us like our Moses and our Elijah in our life who will be there to mentor us and help us and encourage us because that's what Jesus did in his time of despair. And so I am telling you that's what I'm trying to teach you as we come up on this 40 Days of Community. If you feel like you are, your flame is going out in your life and your flame is going out in your faith and you're becoming discouraged and you've been running away from... Uh, from God, and you're trying to maybe to pray to God or do this or do that. You got the wrong approach. What you really need to do is you need to be in the presence of others and take other people with you to encourage you and give you strength. I'm going to tell a story. True story. There was a pastor. Actually, it was shared by the, the pastor. Now the name of the pastor just goes blank on me. I met this guy. He was a relatively well-known evangelist. Um, my goodness, I can't remember his name. Nevertheless, he told me a story of how he went to a camp one time, and he was with a young man, maybe 25, 26, 27, somewhere there, 
who was losing his faith and losing his relationship with God and feeling like his life, it, it, the light of God was going out in his life and he was very discouraged and caught in a cycle of despair. And so he came up and sat beside the pastor in front of a fireplace and he talked to the pastor and said, Pastor, I'm really discouraged. He says, I feel like my faith is gone. I feel like I've got just a little ember and it's just dying and flickering out. And uh, so the pastor's listening to this, and they're watching the fire. The pastor goes and grabs, you know, one of those little shovels that you use for shoveling the ashes in the fireplace. And he shovels around the fireplace while he's listening to the young man, and he pulls out a little ember, you know, a little piece of wood, a little ember that's glowing hot. And he takes it, and he drops it on the mantelpiece. Mantel piece. And he puts the shovel back, and he sits there and listens to the boy. And, he's, and the pastor's sitting there watching that really red-hot coal. And while he's listening to the young man talk, and finally the young man runs out of things to say, and the pastor just sits there and watches that hot coal become black, because it coals, you know? It, it gets cold. The pastor doesn't say a word. The 27-year-old is sitting there thinking, Are you going to say anything to me? How can I get my life back together? The pastor doesn't say a word. He waits about five, ten minutes. He stands up. He goes over. He picks up that now cold piece of charcoal, charcoalish wood that's now cold to the touch. He looks at it. He goes over. He drops it back into the fire. It starts to glow red again. The pastor walks away. What's the lesson? I'll tell you what the lesson is. You want to know why your faith is weak and why you feel like the embers of your life are going out and why you are discouraged? Because sometimes in this society we are surrounded by millions and millions and millions, billions of people in this world because we separate ourselves from the body of Christ, from the burning flame of other people, and we wonder why our faith goes cold. Because I will tell you, there are times I am so discouraged. I'm so frustrated. There are times that I lose hope. And then I get together with you all, and guess what happens to me? Those embers start shooting up in flames again, don't they? Because you all have faith for me. That's what you do for me. That's what we are supposed to do for each other. You cannot walk the journey of your life and your faith alone without other people. Not just without God. We all know we need God. But guess how God comes to us? Through other people. I am encouraging you today. This is what I said to our early service. We need to stop looking back. I know it's sad. Everything we've lost and we're going to lose more. But we need to start looking forward. And we need to walk this journey together. And so I'm encouraging you all to walk this journey with our seniors. For those who are online and watching us, I'm hoping that you make yourself known. Please, I already told you there's about 8 to 10 families every single week watching the service online. I am asking you, I'm begging you to let us know who you are. And this I promise. You know, I'm going to tell you why a lot of people online will never tell you who they are. You want to know why? Because they're cynical and they're skeptical of churches and they think we're going to hit them up for money. Do I ever ask you guys for money here? No. Never. Never. And I promise you folks online this. We will never ask you for money. We don't care. It is all about us walking together in relationship with God. Because I'm going to tell you how much money it costs to run a church. Nothing. If you got a pastor out there sitting, you begging you for money and asking online, send us some money. Well, you know what? They're not being faithful. Because I don't need to ask for money. I'm never going to ask you. I'm just asking you to let us know who you are so that we can encourage and you can walk beside the people in this church who need your encouragement. And so we can walk beside you and encourage your faith. And I'm asking folks in our other service on Tuesday to do the same. And how are we going to do that? During this season of Lent, walking together in our time of need so that we can pick each other up so we can make our embers nice and hot once again. I'm going to ask us to pray. And then we're going to sing a song closing today.
Heavenly Father, I am thankful for this fellowship of Christians. I know that we come to you in various forms and styles in our lifestyle. I and mean, some of us are, I mean, I should say, some of us in our faith are very strong right now, very encouraged. And we're looking forward to the bright and brand new day. We believe that this church is continuing to transform and there's opportunity and hope for us. And we believe that there's new life. But I will say this, our older folks are concerned as they look around, they see people dying, and they're afraid everything's dying around them, and I say, yeah, it is. And you know what, it's okay, because guess what happens on the other side of death? Resurrection, new life, and new birth. And so it is going to cost us our lives here. But in the end, God is faithful to raise up that which is dead and give it new life. And so we lose a part of this church, and I am very indeed sorrowful, filled with sorrow over what we are losing. But I'm also very encouraged by what we see that we are gaining. And you are always faithful, God. And I give you thanks for that. Let us not be discouraged. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.